So it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my talk is really focused on the Utah perspective, and I'm going to spend some time uh, telling you about Utah Telehealth Network and the different clinical programs that we here, have here in Utah. So. I usually put a slide up just to put the definitions for telehealth and telemedicine. And throughout my talk, I'll be using these terms interchangeably. But generally speaking, telehealth is the broad definition, whereas telemedicine is really patient-centric and patient-focused. The different types of telehealth that we are actually doing here in Utah include live interactive video conferencing. And I did want to take a moment just to get uh, if you do telemedicine, clinical telemedicine, would you raise your hand so I know? Okay, so we have, a, we have f about five or so participants. So um, we do asynchronous and synchronous telemedicine, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about these types of, of telehealth. We have a unique uh, remote monitoring project that is happening right now. Patient portals are telehealth. So we need to even think in the U.S. anyway, I know this is a global conference, about meaningful use and how we can engage the patients more readily in their patient care, which I think has been discussed in the previous session. And I think one of the things, I guess it was a great lead up, but telehealth is a disruptive technology, potentially, with the use of mobile health, the use of smartphones and mobile devices. So I wanted just to put a picture up here so those of you that are not doing clinical telemedicine can actually see what it looks like. So you can see here a telestroke consultation where on the left is a neurologist, a brain attack physician, actually demonstrating to the patient who's at a remote rural hospital part of the examination, part of the neurological examination. I'm going to take a few minutes and just tell you about Utah Telehealth Network. And I want to tell you about Utah Telehealth Network if you um, are from Utah, which I think there is a fair number of you. We're a great resource to help you with your global connections and your, your connections throughout um, the world. So our mission is actually to expand the access to healthcare services and resources, predominantly in Utah and, and the Intermountain West. But we have connected to um, many international sites, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, Utah Telehealth Network started in 1996, so that's about 17 years ago. So we've been in the business for a while. We have relied and we still do rely upon funding from universal service to actually decrease the telecom costs for our rural partners and grants from the federal government as well as the University of Utah Hospitals Foundation. Those were used initially to get us started, but today we actually have three federal grants. We have a HRSA grant from the Office of the Advancement of Telehealth, which is our remote monitoring project. We also have the FCC grant to provide broadband to increase the speed for our rural partners. And um, we actually have a USDA grant to, actually, to replace old video conferencing equipment. So telehealth um, has some unique challenges, which I'll, I'll talk more about. So we do rely upon different funding sources, and in particular, the ongoing funding from the state of Utah. We have members who actually are uh, paying a fee for services that, and this is just a list of them, I won't read that off to you, but it's pretty varied. The University of Utah Hospital, many of the independent rural hospitals in Utah, even Intermountain Healthcare, all are members of Utah Telehealth Network. So we provide basically networking services to many of these sites. Of course, uh, the University of Utah Hospital has, has their own intranet, Intermountain Healthcare their own intranet, but we have the capabilities of, of connecting different networks. We provide video conferencing services, 
And with that, we also, which would be of interest to this group, provide bridging services, which helps us to connect more readily to sites that have lower bandwidth. Um, we also do recording and video on demand and podcasting. And this is just a, a picture of Utah. It's not representative of all of the sites that we have. We have over 50 um, member sites here in Utah alone. We actually have one site in um, Ely, Utah. I think it's worth to take a moment that the um, HRSA is actually funding some telehealth resource centers throughout the nation. And actually, Four Corners Telehealth Consortium has actually there has, um, changed to the Arizona Telehealth Resource Center and the Northwest Regional Telehealth uh, Resource Center. Utah just happens to be kind of in the middle, so we, we get advantage of both of these organizations. But if you have questions about how to do it, you can always contact me or our department, but also throughout the nation there are resource centers available to you to help you get started. This is a list, and it's pretty long, of the different specialties and types of programs that we do here in Utah alone. I have synchronous up there, and there are two, um, there's two typos on here, remote monitoring and teleradiology are asynchronous. But we do real-time video conferencing for all of these specialties. This is just another diagram, Dr. Saffel, who is the director for the Telemedicine Center here at the University of Utah Healthcare, will be talking about the Teleburn program. And I like this slide in particular because it shows what most of our clinical sites have for equipment. And it, there's the mobile cart and also then at the lower, um, there's a little picture of a wound camera. But today, you don't need to have a specialty camera. You can just use your, your iPhone and, and transmit digital images. Here are two unique programs that Utah Telehealth supports. One is the Project Echo. And I don't know, have, have any of you heard of Project Echo? So it's the Extension for Community Health Outcomes. It was started by Dr. Sanjay Aurora in New Mexico with the concept that in our rural communities there aren't sufficient um, healthcare providers, nor do they necessarily know how to take care of complex patients. And the term that he uses to describe this program is knowledge networking. So it's case presentation. So a um, a provider who might be an NP or a PA or a family practice doc would video conference real time with Dr. Terry Box in this instant here at the University of Utah and present their de-identified cases for case management to a team of specialists. Dr. Terry Box, who's a hepatitis specialist, a psychiatrist, nutritionist, pharmacist, etc. And the whole idea behind this program is to actually increase the knowledge base of the local care provider, keep those patients in their communities where they actually receive better care and actually better outcomes. So Sanjay Arora has, a, has an article um, in JAMA that actually shows his incredible outcomes for hepatitis C patients in New Mexico. We're also going to be starting a pain clinic here in Utah shortly. And then, um, as Dr. Price mentioned, Utah Telehealth Network has helped the Global Surgery Department to actually connect to Haiti and Rwanda. And with Rwanda, it's really this case management um, model of, of presenting of cases, which then there was consultation as well as education. And so I know, though, we were not able to connect to Mongolia. So there are limitations. But we have connected to Africa, as Rwanda, but other places in Africa, Dubai, Australia, in Pakistan, to um, do education and outreach. So this is just an example for the asynchronous, which I think is probably 
the, the easier methodology, particularly in, in third world countries, to use um, some kind of a store and forward of information and data. But here in Utah, of course, everyone's doing teleradiology, diabetic retinal screening, dermatology, and echocardiograms. So let me just talk a little bit about remote monitoring here in Utah. We got an OAT grant about three years ago, and we are monitoring patients with diabetes and hypertension. The whole objective behind this is to empower those patients and engage them in their health care in a preventive mode. We are using both devices, which here you can see the device, which is, can be Bluetooth technology to a blood pressure or a, a blood glucometer. We're having them input their information um, into the device, or we're calling them on the phone, and it's an automatic interactive voice response system where they simple, simply put in their blood pressure, their blood sugar, and there's a clinical pharmacist who's actually monitoring them and looking for alerts. And so far, uh, we have saved uh, numerous patients from going to the emergency room and being hospitalized, but you'll have to stay tuned for the actual um, statistics for that. But we're very pleased. It is, um, it does take a lot of resources though, but it's, it's an excellent concept to decrease healthcare costs. I just threw this in. We're not doing school telemedicine here in Utah, but I wanted to show a picture of how this could happen, particularly with a stethoscope. And, and I'm not gonna talk to this slide, but if you start a telemedicine program, there are many considerations, and how things plug and play is the most important if you're going to start to use peripherals. Another program, not here in Utah yet, but we're hoping, is um, in the acute care setting. And there are numerous um, programs uh, nationally. So one of our favorite topics, though, is mHealth, mobile health, the use of devices, smartphones, laptops. And this is used, as you all know, I think you are all probably uh, pretty proficient at, at using your smartphones and using FaceTime and using Skype. But it is used for provider to provider, for decision support, for patients. I mean, we're hoping that at some point we will really be meeting the patients in their homes in Utah. I mean, this is happening throughout the nation and throughout the world, but uh, we're hoping to move into the patient's home. So when, by the time I'm 90, I won't have to come out to see my family practice doc on a snowy day. So health literacy, um, a key point here is, is looking at the apps. And the FDA is gonna give its final ruling on apps at the end of the, the year, and you need to look at certification. So some physicians are already starting to say to patients, use these apps or that app, Tr track your sleep, track your, your weight, and uh, there are some precautions that if you're going to be using those, you probably need to address institutionally. And patient portals are going to be um, more ubiquitous as we move along. So with mobile technology here in the US, you have to be aware of your security policies. Bring your own device policy. What are you going to allow? Are, is there going to be texting? Is that secure? Are you de-identifying information? Where is the data that you're using with your mobile devices? Where is that being stored? Is it in some cloud server? And is that cloud server in the United States or where. So you need to just be aware of, of security issues and there are numerous of them. This is just a small list. But social media, basically at the University of Utah Health Center, we actually do not advocate social media, the use of PHI. And people, healthcare providers in Utah and across the nation are being fired from using social media. So be careful of those mobile devices. So I just threw this slide in just to reiterate that we do use um, 
telehealth for educational offerings. And I don't think I mentioned that we have the capability of web streaming. So if you have an educational offering, we can web stream that, which doesn't require as much bandwidth, but is not interactive. There's a lot of challenges, and uh, technically, uh, going to global areas, you really need to look at your networking, your broadband capabilities, what kind of speed. But Utah Telehealth Network has a team of network engineers, video conferencing engineers, and we can help you make connection with the IT in uh, remote areas and can work out all those details for you. So there are many challenges with telemedicine from financial to legal to licensure. And I think some of these challenges go away as you go um, international, but uh, I think that's something that needs to be considered. Um, and I always just like to put out a little bit of information about clinical considerations, being that um, I'm an RN and as the outreach coordinator, I actually implement these programs that if you're going to start a program, if it's for education, which is, might be that low-hanging fruit and it's easier to implement, and then go into a clinical, you really need to stop and you need to think about what all the requirements are. Who are the end users? What are the processes? What are the workflows? And we always advocate that you have someone like me write down the details so you know who's doing what, when, where, and why and of course, evaluation. And I think that probably wraps up my time. But if you have any um, questions, I'd be happy to answer those, but I also know there's a panel that's going to um, be available for telehealth. Thank you.